Hey there, how's it going everybody? In this video, we're gonna be learning how to install Visual Studio Code and set up a Python development environment. We're also gonna go over the different features of this editor to see why so many people are switching over to this. So we'll cover how to switch between Python interpreters, how to debug applications, learn how Git integration works, uh, look at unit testing capabilities, and a few other things. So I've had a ton of comments and requests to cover VS Code, and it just seems like so many people have switched over. Uh, I don't know how many of you all listen to Talk Python podcast with Michael Kennedy, but at the end of every show, he always asks his guests which editor or IDE that they prefer to use. And I feel like it used to be pretty mixed, but now I hear VS Code so often on there that I figured I had to take some time to try this out. And I've got to say, I'm really impressed with it so far. Uh, I wouldn't doubt if you all see me using this from here on out in my videos. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started and see how to get this set up. And I'll show you what I like so much about this. Now, I did run into some differences between how this works on Mac and Windows, so I decided to just make one video specifically for Mac and one specifically for Windows. Now, in this video, we're going to be covering how to use VS Code on Mac, but if you're using Windows, then I'll be sure to leave a link to that video in the description section below. So first of all, let's install Visual Studio Code. So I've got their website pulled up here in my browser, and that is at code.visualstudio.com. Now, Visual Studio Code is different from Visual Studio, which is a full IDE. Uh, VS Code is a lighter weight editor that can be extended with plugins for whatever you need. So be sure that you search for Visual Studio Code and not just Visual Studio. Now, I'll also have a link to this page in the description section below to avoid any confusion there. Now, VS Code is free, so we don't need to buy anything. We just need to download it and install it. Now, for anyone who has watched my Homebrew tutorial, then you can also download VS Code through your terminal, which uh, with Homebrew Cask, if you find that easier. But I'm going to download this from their website. So I'm just going to click Download up here. And now it's going to ask me to choose my operating system. And I'm just going to choose the Mac. And now it should uh, download this here. And this downloads into a zip file. So I'm just going to unzip this and then I can put this here in my applications. So I'm going to open, open my applications in a new tab and I will just drop Visual Studio Code into my applications there. So now let's open that up. So I will open up Visual Studio Code here for the first time and it'll ask me if I'm sure I want to open it. I'll say yes. And now I will just go ahead and maximize this. So at first, when we first open this, it opens up their getting started page here in your browser. So I'm just going to ignore that, but they do have a lot of nice information on there. So let's open up VS Code here and I will uh, enlarge this here. So here we're greeted with their welcome screen and there's a lot of great information on here. We can see that they have a printable keyboard cheat sheet here, introductory videos, tips and tricks, uh, how to change your color schemes and all kinds of stuff. Now we're gonna cover a lot of this in the video. Uh, so I'm not gonna click on any of these right now. So I'm just going to enlarge this a little bit so that we can see this a little bit easier. And I'm also going to close this welcome page since we're going to go over this, uh, a lot of this stuff ourselves. So we can see that this has a very simple design, which is definitely nice once you get used to it, uh, because you don't have a lot of stuff in your way. But when you're new, uh, it might be hard to remember your way around because uh, we just mostly have icons instead of descriptions. So this bar over here on the left is the activity bar. And this is our main navigation for the editor. So if you hover over any of these uh, for any amount of time, then it should pop up after a second or two with a short description. So this says that it is the Explorer. So if I click on this, then this is where we can uh, see our open directories and files. Now we don't have anything open right now, uh, but we have the option to open a project folder here. Uh, now the second icon on the activity bar uh, allows us to search through all of our files. And so that's where we can do searches, finds, and replace within multiple files. Now the third icon here on the activity bar is our Git integration. And we'll take a look at this here in a bit and see how to push some code up to GitHub, um, but we are gonna skip it for now. Now the next icon here is the debugging icon. Now this is one very nice feature that VS Code has over uh, other simple editors. I find the debugging pretty intuitive and easy within VS Code. And we'll take a look at that here in a bit as well when we debug some code. Um, okay, so lastly, the last icon on the activity bar is one that we're gonna be using right now. And this is for managing extensions. And if we make this a little bit wider here, then it should so show us some icons here. Okay, so there those are. 
Okay, so right off the bat, it shows us some recommended uh, extensions here at the top, and then it shows us some popular extensions right below that. Uh, now, you might not have these recommended extensions. Uh, if you do, then they might not be the same ones. Uh, so for example, we can see that this is uh, recommending Heroku CLI to me, and that's because I have the Heroku CLI installed. And if I actually click on one of these recommended extensions, then at the top of the description here, we can see that it says this extension is recommended because you have Heroku CLI installed. So this will look in your system here and find a couple of other things that you already have installed and re recommend uh, plugins for you that they think you might like. Now, it's kind of strange. I would have thought that they would recommend the Sublime Text plugin here. Uh, they usually do. They did on my laptop, uh, but they're not here. But usually it recommends this as well, Sublime Text Key Mapping Extension. And what the, and it does say that this is recommended here, so I'm not sure why it wasn't popping up in the recommended. Uh, but what this does is they have a lot of different key mappings and settings, uh, uh, plugins for those, where if you want to import your key mappings or settings from another program like Sublime or maybe Vim or something like that, uh, then you could just install the plugin and it'll do its best to match those settings to what you already have set there. So I'm going to clear this out. And now let's look at these popular e extensions here. Now the extension that we're really after right now is the Python extension. And this is the most popular extension on VS Code by far. So we can see here, uh, this is now sorted by popularity. If I wanna be sure that it's sorted by popularity, then I could uh, click up here in these three dots here and get this drop down. And now we can see that we can sort these in some way. So I can show the extensions by certain criteria. So either recommended or popular. Um, so if I do show popular extensions, then I can sort either by install count, rating, or name. So right now it's sorted by rating. And we can see that Python is here at the top with nearly 41 million installs. And the next one below that doesn't even have half of that. So this extension is definitely the most popular right now. So we can see in the description here that it says that this extension adds support for linting, uh, debugging, formatting, unit testing, and IntelliSense. And IntelliSense is what shows us what attributes and methods we can use while we're typing. And it also gives us information about those as well. And we'll see that in action in just a bit. So I'm going to install this Python extension. So I'll just click install here. Now this might take a second since this is a larger extension, uh, but it shouldn't take too long. Okay, so that just now finished. Okay, so now I'm going to open up some existing Python code uh, that I have in a folder here on my desktop. So let me open this up here. And now I'm going to go to open folder. And then I will go to my desktop here and open up this uh, folder called my project. And I have a script, a file in here called script.py. Now, if you don't have any Python code to work with right now, then you can simply create a project for yourself and just add a .py module in there to follow along. Now, you do need to have a .py extension so that it knows that it's a Python module and gives you some nice syntax highlighting. So uh, let me open up the script that I have here. And I'm just going to close down a couple of these warnings here for now, and we will look at those later. Let me make this just a little bit larger again so that we can be sure we can see everything here. Okay, so here I've got a simple Python script. So first I'm importing sys and I'm printing out sys.version and sys.executable. Now this will let me know what version of Python I'm using and where it's located on my computer. And then I just have a simple function that creates a greeting. And then I'm printing out a couple of greetings here at the bottom. I just want some sample code so that we can see what some of this syntax coloring looks like. Okay, so first, let's see how we can run this Python code. So by default, our Python extension is going to use the first Python interpreter that it finds on our system path. Now, if you don't have Python 3 installed, then this might be using Python 2. And if it is, then I'll show you how to change that in just a bit. Uh, but for now, let's just try to run this. So to do this, we can just right click, whoops, we can just right click anywhere here in our module. And towards the bottom, we'll see a couple of run lines here. So run current test file, run Python in, term in terminal, run selection line in Python terminal. We want this one here, run Python file in terminal. So I'm going to click on that, and that should run the Python file that we have here in our terminal. 
Now we're going to look at how to use keyboard shortcuts to run a code here in just a bit. So if you don't like right clicking to run your code, then don't worry, we'll see how to make it more simple in just a second. But for now, if we look at my output, then it looks like I'm using Python 3.7 and it prints out the location to where that Python is located on my machine. And then it prints out our two greetings here, hello world and hello Corey. Now, what if we wanted to change our Python interpreter uh, for how this runs our code? Now, there are a couple of different ways that we can do this. So first, if we look at the blue bar here at the bottom of the page, uh, then in the bottom left, it shows us which Python interpreter it is currently using. So we can see here it says Python 3.7. And if I click on that, then we can change our interpreter. So if we wanted to change to Python 2, uh, we can see that this brings up a lot of options here because I have a few different versions of Python installed on my system here and also a couple of virtual environments here with conda but if i wanted to do python 2 then it's the one at the top here within user bin python so i'm going to click on that and again i'm going to ignore the warnings there for now and we'll take a look at those in a bit and i will just clear my terminal down here and now i'm going to right click and run python file in terminal again now we can see this is using python 2.7 and also the location uh, of that Python executable changed as well. Now, if this text is still a little bit too small here, let me make it just a little bit larger. I'm gonna change, show you how to change the settings here in just a bit uh, to where I can get this text looking exactly how I like it. Okay, so that is using Python 2.7, uh, but I wanna go back to using Python 3. So again, I'm just gonna click down here in the bottom left and go and find Python 3.7 uh, that I want to use. So I'll click on that, and now we are using Python 3.7 again. Now, if you don't have Python 3 installed, then I definitely recommend installing it. Uh, if you'd like to see how to install that on both Mac and Windows, then I do have a separate video where I show how to do that for both operating systems. So I'll be sure to put a link to that video in the description section below if anyone in needs to see how to install that. And in that installation video, I show how you can get it in your path and everything like that. So once it's in your path, then VS Code should automatically pick that up and allow you to use that by clicking down here in the bottom left, and it should just automatically show up there. Now, when I changed my interpreter, you may or may not have noticed that VS Code created a folder inside of my project directory here called .VS Code. And that directory uh, within it has a settings file, settings.json. So these are settings specific to our current workspace or this current project folder. Uh, so I'm going to open that up over here and we can see that right now it's setting that Python interpreter that we just set. But what if we wanted to use a certain Python interpreter by default for every single project? So to do that, we're gonna to need to set it in our global user settings. And while we're talking about our user settings, let's also make some other global changes as well. So let's look at how to change our color theme, our, our uh, file icons and things like that, so we can kind of personalize this editor a bit. So first, let's change our color themes. Now there are several built-in color themes that we can use. So to change your color theme, let's open up our command palette. So this is the first time that we've opened the command palette, but it is extremely useful. You can basically access everything within VS Code through the command palette. So we can access that by pressing Command Shift P, and it's going to open up the command palette here to where we can type in a command. So now, if we want to change some color themes, then I'll just type in color, and we can see that it starts uh, auto-filling uh, some results here. So we can see that color theme is right down here. So I'm going to open that up, and now it gives us our options here. And if I just hit up and down on the arrow keys here, then this is automatically going to show us what this looks like as I'm going up and down here on the keyboard. So that's a nice feature. Now, if uh, I have this maximized a lot so that you guys can read, uh, but usually this is a smaller window here to where we can actually see the syntax in the background and make our choice uh, based on uh, how that looks with our syntax highlighting. Now they do have some nice themes here by default, but I actually want to go down here at the bottom to install additional color themes. Now, if any of you have uh, followed along with my videos before, then you probably know that within Sublime Text, my other editor that I use, I really like a theme called Predon. And there actually is a port 
of this over on VS Code as well. So if we look at this, uh, the one that looks the same as the one in Sublime is this pre-dawn theme kit. This pre-dawn twilight doesn't quite look the same. So this pre-dawn theme kit here, if I install that, it's also the one that has the most uh, installs. So I'm just gonna choose the basic pre-dawn there. And now if I go back to my script, then we can see that the syntax highlighting changes uh, to something that probably looks more familiar if you've seen my videos before. And there's plenty of other popular color schemes out there. So definitely look around and see what you like. So as programmers, you know, we're in our editors a lot. So you should definitely have something that is pleasant to your specific taste. Now we can also change how the file icons look uh, over here in the sidebar. And to do that, we're going to install something called file icons. So to install file icons, we can open back up the command palette by pressing command shift P and I will type in file icons choose a file icon theme. Uh, now, again, we have a couple of defaults here, but I am going to uh, click on install additional file icon themes here. And again, if you ever want to sort these, you can just click on this drop down right here and we can sort by install count, rating and name. So I'm going to sort by install count and it looks like it already was sorted by install count. Now, the one that I like here is called uh, AYU. So I'm going to install that and that's going to be the one that I use. So once we get that, then I'm just going to uh, choose that. Now that also changed our color theme. So I'm just going to change our color theme back to pre-dawn really quick. So I'll click on pre-dawn there. So now I'm going to close down those two items there, go back to my file explorer. And now we can see that this still looks the same, but now I'm going to open up that command palette again. Uh, and we can see that it has my recently used commands here for color theme and file icon theme. Now I'm going to click on that file icon theme and change the file icon theme to that AYU. And I like that one. We can see that it changed the icons over here and gives us a different icon here for open folders and stuff like that. Okay, so I think that this looks pretty good. So right now, when we made those changes, we're actually implicitly changing our user settings by changing our color themes and all of that. But there are tons of other settings that we can change that we haven't seen yet. So if we wanna see all of the settings that we can change, then we can open our settings by going down to the bottom left of our activity bar and clicking on this gear icon. So I'm going to click on this gear icon and the other settings here, there are uh, command pilot uh, or command palette settings, extensions, keyboard shortcuts, color theme. So we can also change those things from here, but I'm going to click here on settings and open these. And here we have our user settings. Now they used to have this set up to where it opened up the default settings and your user settings side by side in JSON format. And I kind of like that a bit better but now they have it opened up in this UI version instead. So you can change your user settings using this user interface, but honestly, I hardly ever use this. Uh, maybe it's because I'm coming from Sublime Text, but I like to use the JSON settings a lot more than this. And I feel like it just gives you a better overview of what you're changing but we can still get the JSON version of our user settings by clicking on this little bracket symbol here in the top right. So I'm gonna click on that and now it's gonna open our user settings in JSON format. So since these are our user settings, this is only gonna show us the settings that we have changed from the default. So I've changed the zoom level here by zooming in and making the text larger. Um, now we have also changed the color theme here to pre-dawn and the icon theme to AYU. And I have some other preferred settings that I'm gonna show in just a bit. Now, I do wish that they still showed the default settings uh, side by side by default, because I feel like someone who's new to VS Code might not know what settings they can change or how to see the default settings. So I'm gonna change my settings so that it does show my user settings and default settings side by side. So to do this, I'm first going to open up the default settings and I can do that using the command palette. So I'm gonna press command shift P and now I'm going to type in default settings and we can see it says open default settings in JSON. So I'm gonna click on that. So now I'm gonna change a few settings here that will show me the default settings while I'm modifying my user settings. Now, you don't have to do what I'm doing here, uh, but I personally find it so much easier to modify my settings this way. So I'm gonna search for uh, workbench settings. So up here in the top, 
I'm going to press Command F to do a search here, and I'm going to search for Workbench Dash Settings. So now we can see our Workbench Settings here. So we have our editor and things like that. So that is going to be the first one that I change. So we can see that currently the Workbench setting is set up to use the UI editor by default. I'm going to change that to use JSON by default. So I'm going to copy that and paste that into my user settings, and I'm going to change that to JSON. Now, a quick tip here, uh, when you're within settings, if you click this little pencil icon over here to edit, then it'll show you a drop down of all the valid choices. And I think that's extremely useful. So we can choose UI there. And this is telling me that I would have to save this first in order to do that. Um, so I could either choose UI or I could choose JSON. Okay, so a couple of other settings that I wanted to change here. Um, down here, this workbench.settings.open default settings. Uh, I want my default settings to open so that I can see all of those. Uh, so I'm going to change that from false to true. So I will save and try that again. So now that is true. And lastly, I'm going to come down here and this workbench.settings.use split JSON. This is what's going to split uh, my default settings from my uh, user settings. And this used to be the default with VS Code, but they changed it along the way. So now that I've got that set to true, I'm going to close down both of my settings tabs here. And now I'm going to reopen those. So I'm going to click down here on the gear icon, click on settings. And now let me close my sidebar here so that we can see this a little bit better. Now we can see that it opens up my settings in JSON mode, and also it shows me the default settings over here on the left uh, with a comment of what each of these do, and my user settings over here on the right. So with these comments, I now know exactly what each setting change actually means instead of just guessing over here. Um, and these are also split up into different categories. So if I collapse commonly used, then we can see that if I want to change editor settings, then I can look in here. Uh, if I want to change uh, Python settings, I can scroll all the way down here to Python, and there's a bunch of Python specific settings here. So I think this is just much easier to see what is available to you. Now we started looking at these settings because I wanted to change my Python path by default to where it uses a certain version of Python for every file by default. So I want to change that Python path. So to do that, I can come up here into search settings. And now if I search for python.p, then we can see we get a few matches here, but one of these is Python dot Python path. And right now it's set to use just this basic Python command. Now, instead of copying and pasting this over into my user settings, when we have it set up this way, we can just click on this little pencil icon over here to the left. And if I do that, then I can go to copy to settings and it automatically puts that over here in my user settings. So now I want to put the full path to the version of Python that I want to use by default. So I have my integrated terminal open down here at the bottom. Uh, I want to get my path for Python 3. So to do that, I'm just going to type in which Python 3, and we can see that that prints out my path to Python 3. Yours might be different than this. Uh, so I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to paste that in here to my Python path so that it uses that for every file that we open. So now anytime we're working with a Python file, it should use that version of Python by default without us needing to change any Python interpreters. Now, while we're in our settings, you can also make other changes to your editor that you'd like to make. So I'm going to copy and paste a few settings here into mine. Now, you don't have to do this. Again, they're just my personal preferences. Uh, but let me grab these, and I'll explain what some of these do. So I'm going to copy these here, and I will paste these in to my settings. So within my user settings here, I'm just going to paste these in below. And save that. So now, okay, the text is a little bit large here. Let me close down some of this stuff so that we can see a little bit better. Now the text is definitely too large here uh, because I have this set on a zoom level of four. So let me zoom out just a little bit. And now, so the zoom level will allow us to see things like the sidebar a little bit better, but now our text is still a little bit too large. So let me change this to a size of 20. 
Um, actually, let me do an 18. And I know that looks larger than an 18 font size, but you have to remember we're also zoomed in to the editor. So that's why it looks that large. Okay, so I think an 18 font size with a zoom level of three allows us to see this text pretty well and also allows us to see the sidebar over here pretty well. So I'm going to leave it like that. Now these other changes here, I'm just also changing uh, the font weight. Uh, I'm changing the font family to be source code pro. I like the source code pro from Google fonts. You can uh, download that. I'll leave a link to that in the description section below as well. And we can also change the font size and the font family of our debug console and also the font size of our integrated terminal. So that is what those uh, setting changes are doing there that I just pasted in. So now I'm gonna close down these settings and go back here to my script.py. So now VS Code should be using that version of Python that we set in our settings uh, by default, unless we change our interpreter specifically for our project. Now, why would you want to change your, specific, your uh, interpreter specifically for one project? Well, the most common reason is because it's usually a good idea to create a virtual environment for your projects. Uh, so let's see how to create a virtual environment, and then we'll set that as our interpreter for this specific project. So I'll create one for the current project that we currently have open. Uh, so to do this, I'm going to open up my integrated terminal. I think that's the easiest way to create these virtual environments. So I'm going to open that up. Uh, you can either drag here from the bottom or you can press control tilde and that'll open up the integrated terminal for you. So I'm going to clear the terminal there. And when you open up your integrated terminal, it should already be navigated to our uh, current project directory. And that's where I'm going to create a virtual environment. If you want to check your exact directory, then you could always type in PWD and it will show you the directory that you're in. Uh, so we can see that I am in that project folder on my desktop. So I'm going to clear that output there. So like I said, I'm already within my project folder. So now I'm going to create a new virtual environment using the VENV module from the standard library. Now, if you don't know how to create virtual environments using VENV, then I do have a separate video that goes into more detail about how to do that. So I'll be sure to leave a link to that video in the description section below as well if anyone is interested. But basically, to do this, we can simply say Python 3 or Python if you have it set up that way. Sometimes we have to use Python 3. So Python 3 dash M V E N V, which is the module we're going to run. And now the name of our virtual environment, I'm also just going to call my virtual environment V E N V. So I'm going to run that and that creates a virtual environment within our project folder. Uh, now to use that for our project, we just need to change the interpreter like we did earlier. So I can click down here in the bottom left. And when I do that, if I look down here at the very bottom, we can see that we have a Python 3.7 version, and then this V, E, and V is within uh, quotations here, and we can see the path to this is in the current directory, forward slash V, E, and V. So that is the virtual environment that we just created. So I'm going to choose that as our Python interpreter for this specific project. And again, if we open up those VS Code settings, then that was set right there. Our Python path for this specific project uses this virtual environment, uh, forward slash bin, bin, forward slash Python. So now I can close those. So VS Code automatically picked up that virtual environment because it picks up virtual environments within the base of our project, like we created here. Uh, but it'll also pick up things like Condivot environments uh, as well, like we saw before. Now, if you're using a virtual environment that's located elsewhere on your machine, then to do that, you can just, you know, open up the settings.json file that we saw earlier and drop in the path into that settings.json file to uh, whatever virtual environment you want to use. Now, you might keep getting these linter Python not installed down here, uh, and I just keep exiting these. Uh, it's because it wants us to install a linter, but the reason I keep exiting this is because we're going to look at this in just a bit, but I'm going to keep exiting that for now. Now, when we have a virtual environment activated, it will actually activate that virtual environment in all new terminal sessions that we open as well, which is a really nice feature. So let me delete the current terminal that I have open right now by uh, selecting that trash can and now I'm going to reopen a new one so I can just press uh, control tilde like we did before and when we did that we can see that it automatically sourced and activated that environment and that V E N V environment is activated we can see it here uh, within these brackets 
So now if we wanted to install some packages in this virtual environment, then we should just be able to do this with a pip command. So we don't even need to uh, activate that. I can just say pip install requests. And once that's installed, we should be able to just import that into our scripts with no problem. So underneath sys here, I'm going to import uh, requests. So I'll import that. And let me clear my terminal here so that we don't have so much text in the way. I'll make this a little smaller as well. So I'm going to make sure that request is working by coming down here towards the bottom of the script. And I'm going to remove these current print statements with those greetings. And instead, I'm going to replace those with a request. So I can say R is equal to request. Now, as I'm typing here, let's also pay attention to the IntelliSense that's built into VS Code and see how this shows us the attributes and methods that we can use for different objects. So I can choose requests here. And now whenever I put in request dot, it should recommend uh, different things to us here. So if I scroll down, we can see that these methods are these little boxes here. So we have get, head, options, post, things like that. And we have all of this different documentation here as well. So let's say I uh, hovered over, if I do request.get, we can see that we also have this little information box over here. So if I click on that, then it'll show us over here uh, what this expects. So it expects a URL and also some of these parameters and a description of what this method does. So that's a nice, uh, neat little trick there. Also, if I click on that, then I can right click on that method and we can see that we have a couple of options here. We have go to definition, uh, we have peak definition. So let me go to go to definition. So what this did is it actually opened up uh, where that method is defined within the request library. So we're in our Python site packages here, actually within that request code. And we can actually see that get method written out here. Now, if we didn't want to totally open up that file, then I can also right click that and go to peak definition. And that's just going to let us peek at that definition of where that function is defined. So if I click that X over there, then we go right back to our file. So I think that's extremely useful. The IntelliSense here is really smart and really knows how to show us exactly what we're looking for. So now uh, let me actually request a URL here. So I'm going to go to, let's see, HTTPS. I'll just go to my personal website at coreyms.com. So uh, over up here at the top, I'm going to, I'm just going to comment out the sys.version that we're using. I'm going to uh, keep the sys.executable there so that I'm sure we're using our virtual environment. Uh, but to test this, I'm going to just do a print and I'm going to print out r.statuscode. So the status code will just be uh, the status code that we get back from that request. So I'm going to save that and I'm going to run it. So I'll right click, run Python file in terminal. And whenever we run that, uh, we can see that it did use that virtual environment and we got a status code of 200. Okay, so now that we've seen how to use these virtual environments, now let's see how we can auto format our Python code. So right now we don't have a formatter installed. So we have seen those pop ups, those pop up notifications saying that we don't have formatters installed. So I'm actually going to listen to that pop up this time and actually use a formatter. So to try to try to format our code manually, we can use a keyboard shortcut. So to do this, it is shift option F. So or shift alt F. So I'm going to use shift option F to try to format the code. And now it's saying, Hey, uh, you don't have a formatter installed. Do you want to use auto pep eight? So auto pep eight is very popular and it's what they use by default. Uh, I've actually heard some good things about black here and it also recommends black. So I'm actually going to click on that, but it's just personal preference. If you want to use auto pep eight, then you can do that. I'm going to install black and use that. I actually don't even really know the differences between auto pep eight and black, but I did see a, uh, a blog post on Kenneth Wright's blog, and he said that he uses black. So I kind of want to give it a shot and see if I notice any differences. Um, okay, so with that formatter installed, uh, we can go back up here to our code. And now if I press shift option F, then it will auto format that code for us. Now it might not have looked like it changed all that much because our code was already formatted kind of properly, but let me just mess this up a bit. So let's say that I just have really badly written code here and I didn't put any spaces between anything. So 
uh, I'm going to format this. I'm going to press Shift Option F. And when I auto format that, we can see that it now puts all those spaces in place where they should be and makes our clone uh, our code a lot cleaner. Now, sometimes when we change settings in our project, uh, sometimes it might actually only make those changes in our workplace settings and not in our um, actual global user settings. So I'm going to open up the settings here real, qu real quick and check this. So within my workspace settings, we can see that it uh, changed our Python formatting provider to use black. Uh, I don't think it put that in my user settings. So let me check if it did. It doesn't look like it did. So I'm going to add that in there as well. And if you ever want to see this a little bit better, you can always close your sidebar there to see a little bit better. Now, while I'm in here in my settings, I'm also going to change my settings so that my code uh, automatically formats anytime I save a file. So I could search for the settings that I need to change, but let me show you a nice tip that I use a lot. So if we start typing and press uh, control space, then it'll actually show us our options while we type. So uh, right underneath where I set my uh, formatting provider there, I'm also going to, let's see, if I press control space, then we have all of our settings here. So now I'm just going to type in uh, format, and we can see here that this fills in editor.format on save. So that's another way that you can discover uh, settings by doing that. So right now it's set to false. I want to set that equal to true so that our code is automatically formatted anytime we save a file. Okay, so now I'm just going to close down those settings. Now the auto formatting in VS Code really is great. Uh, it has auto, auto formatting for JSON and other languages as well. And those are all things that require additional packages with editors like Sublime Text. And those can also be, you know, sometimes hard to get set up properly in those other editors. So it's nice that this stuff just works so easily within VS Code. And I don't think that this is part of the formatter, but we can also use VS Code to sort our imports too. So first, let me add a couple of other imports up here uh, so we can see what this looks like. So I'm going to also import OS, and I'm also going to import math. Now, if I open up my command palette here, then I'm going to search for sort imports. And we can see it says Python refactor sort imports. I'm going to click on that then we can see that it sorted those imports. Now, I think that it separated out requests here since that's a third-party package. So it probably has all of the third-party packages and the standard library modules uh, split up like that. And if you have any uh, from imports, then it would put those closer to the bottom uh, just because it looks better. So for example, if I was to come up here and say, uh, you know, from OS import, whoops, import uh, rename, then, I did a sort of imports again, so sort imports. Then we can see that it moves that from import there to the bottom. Okay, so now that we've done code formatting, now let's also enable linting. So we've been getting these linting uh, warnings here this whole time, so now we're actually going to use this. So linting will look at our code and tell us if it thinks something is off. And it's nice because you can, you know, this can keep you from making mistakes that you might not notice on your own. So uh, we could install this from the command palette. I could install it here. Uh, but if that pop-up doesn't pop up for you, then you can also use the command palette. So if I open up the command palette and type in linting, then I'm just going to click here on run linting. And when I do that, that will trigger that pop-up for you. So this might tell you that you don't have a linter of PyLint installed. So it uses PyLint by default, and I actually like PyLint a lot, so I'm going to keep that one. And so if I want to install that, we can just click Install, and it's going to run through that here within our terminal. And now I'm going to uh, put something in here that is going to trigger a linting error and a warning. Uh, so let me comment out here, or let me actually uncomment where I'm printing out this sys.version. And instead, let me accidentally uh, use a print statement like I'm using Python 2. So if I save that, then you can see that we get an underline here. And if I hover over that, then we can see that it says missing parentheses, oops, missing parentheses in call to print. Did you mean? And then it has this long thing here. Now, if we want to see that within our terminal, we can click on this little 
uh, problems section here. And that way we can see that message there in the problem section as well. So it says, did you mean print sys.version? So then I can just go up here and I can fix uh, that syntax mistake there. Uh, now this is also going to give you hints about things that aren't uh, specific errors either. So for example, if I was to uh, go down here into my greet function and I was to put a variable inside my function that I actually never use. So let's say I create a variable called test, set that equal to uh, test and save that. Then after a second, we can see that this gets a little green underlined here. And if I hover over that, then it'll say unused variable test. And then it also says that down here in our problems gives us a little warning, unused variable test. So that's a nice way of getting those types of things pointed out. Uh, us usually things like, you know, unused variables uh, are mistakes, something that we actually didn't intend. So I'm going to remove that. And now it says no problems have been detected in your workspace so far. Okay, so now let me show you another extension that I like that uh, I use to make running Python code a bit easier. So, so far we've been right clicking and selecting run code in terminal, and I'm not the biggest fan of that. So I'd rather just have an easy keyboard shortcut that does this for us. And also it doesn't show as much other stuff in the terminal. Uh, so the extension that I'm going to install here is called code runner. So I'm going to search for that in the extensions. So I'm going to click on extensions here and I will clear our current output, make this a little bit larger here. So I'm going to search for an extension called code runner that's here at the top. And I'm going to install that. And once that's installed, we'll see a little run icon here at the top right of the editor. So there are a few other changes that I like to make to the settings of this extension. Uh, but let's see what it does for us right out of the box. So I'm going to close that extension there. And also I'm going to make those a little bit smaller, go back to my file explorer here. So right out of the box, if I click uh, this run code up here at the top, then we can see this actually didn't work. It says import error, no module named request. And the reason it didn't work is because it's using the default Python command on my machine. We can see that here, uh, it's just using Python. So since it's just using that Python command, it means that it's using Python 2 as well because usually on Mac, the default Python command uh, defaults to Python 2. Uh, so uh, that's what we, why we need to change the settings for this extension. So let's set it to use the current Python interpreter that VS Code is currently using. So to do this, I'm going to open up my settings. So I'm going to close the sidebar so that we have some room here. I'm gonna open up my settings here. I'm gonna make these default settings a little smaller. And there are a couple of settings that I'm going to change here uh, at the bottom of my file. Uh, now, I looked up what settings I'm going to change before I started this video, and I have these written down here in front of me. Now, you could search through and find these settings yourself, but I'm just going to go ahead and write these out. So first, uh, we have one that is uh, code-runner, and we want to change code-runner uh, executor map. So I will type that out, executor map. And this is going to be equal to a, a JSON itself. So within this JSON, uh, I can set what I want to run when we run Python scripts. So for Python, I want this to use. So we're going to add in a few things here. So I'm going to use this dollar sign and say Python path and make sure that that's capitalized correctly. Uh, with the uppercase P there, Python path. So that will use the Python path that VS Code is using. So if VS Code is using your virtual environment, it'll use your virtual environment. If it's using the default uh, Python path up here, then it'll use the default Python path here. So now, so we'll do Python path dash U, and then we want another dollar sign there, full file name with the capitalization just like that. Okay, now I should actually say where I found this. This is actually in the code runner documentation. If I open this back up and 
we scrolled down here to the bottom. These are just things that you kind of have to look for and figure out on your own. Uh, I figured this out before the video, but if you want to make your own customizations, uh, then you'll have to read through documentation like this. Uh, but we can see here in their documentation, they say, you know, if you want to make certain changes, these are the customized parameters. So here we have that Python path with that dollar sign, and it tells us what that does, the path of the Python interpreter um, that is from the select interpreter command and also our full file name the full name of the code of the file being run okay so that is how i find found those just as a side note okay so there are a couple of other changes i want to make here as well so i don't know about you all but whenever i run python code i want the output just to be what the output is of the of the command that i'm running i don't really like having you know, other stuff in the way, like the terminal location and, you know, command took however long to run, anything like that. So, first of all, I'm going to change. I'm going to do a code dash runner of show execution message. And I'm going to set that equal to false because that is what uh, comes up with all this extra information of, you know, the Python path and the file path and stuff like that. I just want the Python output. Okay, so uh, lastly, I'm going to change code runner dot, and I'm going to turn off clear previous output. I'm going to set that equal to true, actually, because I don't want uh, the old output showing up. I only want the newest output. Okay, so now let's go back to our script and see if this works now. And we'll also be able to see the difference of what this does here. So I'm going to comment out that sys.version again, I'm going to leave that sys.executable. So now that we have those changes in place, I'm going to save our file. And now if I click run here, then we can see that this output is so much cleaner. So it is now using our virtual environment. So that's great. Uh, so now it's using, you know, our virtual environments version of requests, and then it just prints out our 200 status code there. And there's no other, you know, stuff here getting in the way like file paths and stuff like that. It is just our output. Now, if you don't like clicking this run command up here, then this does come with a keyboard shortcut as well. So if I right click, it says run code here, we can see that that is control option and in. So if I press control option in, then we can see that our code runs like that as well. And you can change that keyboard shortcut if you'd like. Okay, so moving on. Um, one thing about Sublime Text that people always asked me about was how to do input. And input was actually really hard to do within Sublime. There was a confusing package that you could add on to do it, but I never used that because it was just easier to use the terminal. And that's what I would tell other people, just open up your terminal and run your code that way if you have input. Uh, but if we use VS code and we have input, uh, let me just add some in here. So I'm just going to uh, remove everything below my imports. And now I'm just going to say name is equal to input. And for the input, I'll just say um, your name. And then I will print out a greeting that says hello, comma, and then print out, oh, I don't need a space there, and then print out name. So we're not actually going to be able to run this using the code runner that we just installed because that output is only read only. Uh, and that was our problem within Sublime Text as well. But to run this in VS Code, uh, we can simply do what we did earlier by right clicking and running this within our terminal. So if I do that, then we can see that we have this running here within our terminal and now it's asking us for our input. So I'll put in my name here and then it runs our uh, script just fine. So that worked, it printed out, hello, Corey. So that's just a little side note there that I wanted to show. Uh, if you wanna do input, then input will work, but you will have to use the terminal. So now I'm going to undo uh, a couple of changes to go back to what we had uh, before, before that input, okay? All right, so now let's take a look at the built-in Git integration within VS Code. So let's say that I wanted to track this project with Git and then upload this to GitHub. So to track our current project with Git, we can click on the source control tab over here on our activity bar. So I'm going to click on that. And when I do that, 
So right now, we're not tracking this project with Git. So I could do all of this here within the terminal, uh, but we can also do it here through the interface as well. So to track this project, I can just click on this Git symbol here at the top of our tab right here beside the text of source control. So if I click on that, it says initialize repository. So I'm gonna do that, and now it's asking us which project we want to track, and I'm gonna click the one that I have open there. And now it is uh, going to track this with Git. So the files that just popped up here are files that it wants to stage to be committed. Now, it looks like we have a lot of extra files in our project right now, but these were actually already there. These are from our virtual environment, and VS Code is telling us that they're unstaged. Now, normally you don't want to track virtual environments, so to ignore that, we just need to create a .gitignore file and add that to our repository. So I'm going to go back to our project here, and we can see that the git uh, also adds in color coding here to tell us what's unstaged and what's not. So right now, it's wanting to track our virtual environment. We don't want that. So uh, right here by our project, let's click on this file to create a new file or click on this icon to create a new file. And I'm going to create a new file called .git ignore. And we can see that it automatically fills in that uh, git symbol there beside our file. And now within .git ignore, we want to ignore the VNV module, and we also want to ignore, uh, I'm also going to put the VS Code directory in there as well, I, because I don't think we want to upload our settings and things like that. Those are more personal. Um, so now that we've saved those, we can see that it's no longer color coding our VS Code or our VENV directory, because it's not going to try to stage those anymore. Now, you'll notice that it doesn't actually show us the .git directory that got created when we initialized our directory. Uh, VS Code filters out what files uh, are seen by default, and ones that you normally don't want to see are filtered out. So there's normally no reason to go into certain folders or files, uh, such as .git. So I think it's nice that it filters those out. But if you ever want to make changes to what's shown or hidden, then you can always update your settings and change the hidden files. So now I'm going to go back to my Git section here in my activity folder. So now we can see that the only changes that it wants to stage are the .gitignore file and our script.py. So to stage those changes, I could uh, hover over these one at a time and click the uh, plus icon here beside each file. So if I click that beside git ignore, then we can see that now that went up into our staged changes. Or if we want to stage all of the changes, then we can click on the extra options here at the top right with these three little dots. And then I could just come down here to stage all changes. And that'll add all of those to our stage section here. So now that we have those files staged, in order to commit those, we can simply click here on this check mark. So I'm going to do that and it's going to ask us for a commit message. So I'm just going to type in a commit message of initial commit and hit enter. And now it has committed that code. So we have our code committed to Git. So now it's only going to show us changes that we've made since then. So if I go to my scripts and take out a lot of this stuff that we've put in here, so let's say that I only wanted my module to contain the uh, request code from now on. So I'm going to take out the greet function. I'm going to remove our print statements here. Uh, I'm not using, you know, uh, sys or math or anything like that. So I'm going to remove those as well. Uh, if I save that, it auto formats that code for us. So that's nice. Now, this also gives us some indicators over here of what has changed for our git commit. So if we click that, then we can see that we can take a little peek at what's different. So these red outlines here means that code has been removed. So that's a nice touch there. Now, if we go back to the git section and click on this, then we can see the diff side by side. And you can also change exactly how the diff is seen. You can also layer them on top of each other, but I really like the side by side look. So we have our current file that is committed over here and then how our file looks right now. And it's telling us, hey, we had all of this code here before and now it's gone. So those are actually deletions that I wanted to make. So that's fine. So now I'm gonna click on the plus icon to stage that file. And now I'm going to commit that and when I commit that, I'm just going to leave 
a commit message that says uh, removed some code. Okay, and now that is committed. Okay, so now let's say that we wanted to commit this uh, code in this project up to GitHub. Now, this is pretty simple to do also. All we have to do is create a repository within the browser, and then we can set that up to push to that repo. So I have my GitHub open here uh, within my browser. So let me reload the page and make sure that I'm still logged in here, and it looks like I am, so that's good. Okay, so now, all I have to do is create a new repository. I think I created one the other day called, let's see, demo repository, sample repository. I'm just gonna create a new one here and call it uh, test-repo. Uh, so I am not gonna do a description or anything like that. Uh, so I can just create that repository. And now, whenever you create a new repository, uh, GitHub will show you this quick setup page here. So the commands that it shows us here are commands to create a new repository on the command line, uh, or we want if we want to push an existing repository from the command line. Now we already have an existing repository that we just created within VS Code. So this is the section that I am interested in here. Um, so I'm going to copy this git remote add origin here. And that's what we're gonna to use to connect our local repository to this uh, remote repository that we just created. So I'm gonna copy that and I'm gonna go back to Visual Studio Code. And now I wanna use my terminal uh, to paste that in. So if I, first I'm gonna shut down this diff here. Uh, so to open up my term terminal, that is control tilde. And I'm going to clear the output there. Now I'm going to paste in the command that I got from GitHub, and I am here within my project. So if I run that, then that should now connect our Git project and our local folder here uh, to our remote repository. So now if I go back to our Git section here, then I'm going to click here at the top right of our source control page. And now I'm gonna go down here to the bottom and oh, actually it's up here close to the top. It is push to, so I'm gonna push to, and now I'm gonna push to origin. And that, uh, the, the reason that we have origin there is because we pasted in that get remote add origin command that we got from GitHub. So I'm gonna push to that, and that might take a second. Um, and it asks us here if we want to periodically run git fetch. Uh, you can say yes or no. I'm just gonna say uh, ask me later for now. So now if I go back to the browser, uh, I'm going to look at my repository and we can see that we have a repository with two commits here. And this is uh, our code that we have within VS Code. So now that you have this connected to uh, GitHub, any you can always come in here to uh, Visual Studio Code and make your updates and stage and commit those like we saw before. And then simply come up here and push those and it'll push those to GitHub. So that's how you can work with Git and GitHub and VS Code. And I think it's pretty intuitive how they set that up and it's really nice to use. Uh, now, if you'd like to learn more about Git, then I do have a more detailed video on that. And I'll leave a link to that video in the description section below if anyone is interested. I also plan on doing a detailed video on GitHub in the future, uh, but I haven't got around to doing that just yet. Uh, but I just wanted to cover the basics in this video to get you started. Okay, so now let's look at how to do some basic debugging in Python. Now this is a nice feature in VS Code uh, that doesn't come built in with some other minimalist editors like this. So back in our script here, let's put in, I'm gonna close that getting nor file, uh, let's put in a breakpoint after we make our web, web request, sorry. Uh, so in order to put a breakpoint in, we can just come over here into our gutter and whenever this red dot shows up, we can just click there and that will add a breakpoint. Now I'll click on the debug tab of the activity bar over here and that's where we can start our debugger. So first we're gonna to need to select a debug configuration. So there are some more advanced debug configurations that you can use for debugging applications like Flask and Django. But in this video, uh, let's just look at uh, the debugging basics. So we can click on add configuration and I just want to uh, do a Python file and that'll create some configurations for us here. 
Let me make this a little bit larger here. So now within our debug configuration, we can see that we have uh, this selection here for Python current file. So uh, in order to debug this, I can simply click on this green button and it's gonna debug this here within my terminal. So what that does is it runs our code and it stops at our breakpoint that we added here on line five. So now we can interact with our code as it is at the moment of that breakpoint. So if you look here in the top left, then it'll show you the current local values uh, in our code. And you can drill down into those to see the current values that we have set. So we have this uh, response object here. We can look at all the values of that. Uh, we can look at our request library and all kinds of different things there. Now underneath that variable section, we have a watch section. And within here, we can add a variable there that we'd like to watch and uh, monitor the current value. So if I add a watch statement, then I, let's say that I wanted to watch our dot status underscore code. So if I watch that, then we can see that the current value of that is 200. Uh, now, if we were watching a value in a loop or something like that, then we'd actually be able to see that increment each time through the loop if we had a breakpoint within the loop. So that's a nice feature there. Now, if you want something more interactive, then you can open up the debug console down here within the terminal. So let me open that. And now we can use this debug console here uh, to inspect anything that we'd like. So let's say that I wanted to look at R, for example. So we can see that that is a response object of 200, and we can dig down into that here. Uh, let's say I wanted to get more specific and look at the value of OK. So if I run R.OK, we can see that that's equal to true. If I look at R.URL, then it shows us the URL that we originally requested. So being able to jump into the code at a specific location and see the current values can be extremely useful in a lot of situations. So it's so much better than dropping down print statements or log statements all throughout your code and running your code over and over. Having this debug capability is so much better than that. So this allows you to keep your code clean and avoid those print statements and log statements and also see all of the information that you need in order to make sure that your code is working how you expect. And if it's not uh, working, then hopefully it'll help show you exactly how you can fix it. So once we're at a breakpoint, then we have several other options here. Uh, so we can continue on or we can step over the current breakpoint, uh, step into the code further, uh, step out. We can restart the debugger or we can stop. So if I click on continue, then there are no more breakpoints. So that is just going to run through and complete our script. Okay, so now I'm going to remove that debug breakpoint. So I'm just gonna click there. And when we click there, it removes that breakpoint. Okay, so the last thing that we're gonna take a look at in this video for Python specifically is the unit testing support that they have built into VS Code. Now, I'm really loving their attention to detail and how they covered so many different aspects of helping us manage our code easily, as easily as possible. So having built-in support for all this stuff is definitely a nice addition that you won't find in most other editors. So to show you some unit testing, I'm going to close down my current project and I'm gonna open up a different project that has some sample unit tests. So I close down VS Code there. And now I'm just going to uh, open up my terminal here. And now I'm gonna to navigate to my desktop because that is where I have my sample unit testing code. Now we could open this project like we did last time from within VS Code, but if you want to open a directory or file from the command line, then you can do that with uh, the code command that should have been installed when we installed VS Code. So if I want to open that unit testing directory on my desktop, then I could simply say code and then the name of that directory. And that directory name is unit test demo. So if I run that, okay, so this is saying code command not found. So sometimes uh, it will automatically install that command for you and sometimes it won't. So if I open up Visual Studio Code, let me show you how to install this if you run into that problem. So if I open up the command palette, command shift P, if I type in shell, then we can see here 
that we have one command that says install code command in path. I'm going to click on that. It says that that was successful. So I'm going to open a new terminal here. Now I'll CD to my desktop and I'll say code unit test demo. And now it opens that up within Visual Studio Code. So that's a nice way within your command line to open up uh, directories or files from your command line. Okay, so I'm going to close that and also I'm going to close uh, my other window of VS Code here and just use my unit testing code here. Okay, so within my sample project here, I have a couple of sample unit tests. So I have test underscore calc and I have, let me close these uh, pop-ups there, and I have test underscore employee. Um, so the first thing that we want to do here is we want to open up our command palette. So I'll hit command shift P and I will type in discover and it's already auto completed this for me. It is Python discover test. So I'm going to click on that and this will come up with a pop-up here that will ask us to enable and configure the test framework. So I'm going to click on that and now it's asking us what unit test framework we want to use. Now I'm using the unit test module from the standard library for these tests, but if you're using PyTest or Nose, then you can use those. So select whichever one you're using here, but I am selecting unit test since that's what these tests are written in. So I'm going to click on that and then click on the root directory because that's the directory containing the unit tests. And now we want to select the pattern to identify our test files. So we can see that we have a few different options here. Now my test files are written as test underscore uh, and then the module name. So that would be this option here. So test underscore wildcard. Uh, but however your tests are written, you want to select your naming pattern. So I'm going to select that one. And now that is going to discover uh, my test. Now I'm getting this uh, PyLint is not installed over here. I'm just going to click on do not show that again for now. Okay, so now let me close down our test because we didn't discover those at first. Now let me reopen those now that those have been discovered. And if I look here within test underscore calc, we can see that since it's discovered our test, it's added in some lines to our test file here where we can either run this entire test class here, or we can even run a single test at a time. So for example, if I wanted to only run our test add function here, then I can just click on run test uh, for that specific test. So if I click on that, then we can see that the check mark lets us know that the test passed. And I can run all of the tests if I run the test for this entire class. So if I click on that, then we can see that now all of these have a check mark here. And also if I look down here in the status bar uh, at the bottom, then it says that all four of our tests have passed. So uh, that's a nice indicator there. So now let me change one of these tests so that it fails so that we can see what this looks like. So I'm going to change one of the assertions in my test add function uh, to where this is going to fail. So I'll say that if we add 10 and 5, then it should equal 10. But so if I save that and now rerun these tests here, then now we can see that we get an X here. So these have check marks. This one has an X. And we can see down here at the bottom uh, that we have three check marks and one warning. So if I click on that, then it gives us a few options here. So we can either rerun our tests or I can only run the failed test or I can view the unit test output. So let me take a look at that unit test output. And that is what will show me uh, where we have our uh, failing test. So we can see it ran all of these and that we had a fail on test add. It'll also show us exactly what failed. So it says that this assertion failed here. 15 is not equal to 10. So that's why that failed. So now that we have that information there, then we can go in and either fix our code or fix our tests. So I'm going to fix the test. And then I will just uh, rerun all of these. And now we can see that all of those are passing. Now, lastly, we get uh, an additional tab over here. Oops, let me... Uh, 
close down that terminal there. Uh, now we also get an additional tab over here in our activity bar, and this is a testing tab. So let me click on that to check this out. So it might still be telling us that our test uh, is failing here if you hadn't actually manually come over here and rerun that test after it was failing. But since we did rerun that test, then we can see that all of those are now passing. Uh, so just to see what this looks like, let me make this failing again here so that we can see what a failing test looks like over here. Okay, so now we can see we have our failing test. So, uh, and all of these were passing. So now if I come over here and fix that, rerun that, then we can see that, oh, let me rerun that again. Then we can see that now we get all of those green check marks. Now, if we wanna run all of the tests that we discovered, then we can simply come up here uh, to the top of our file here and click this button with the green check mark here uh, at the top and run them all. So if I click on that, then it'll run all of the tests and we can see that all of those passed again. So I really think that this is an awesome interface for seeing all of our tests in one place. And if something is failing, then we can easily come in here and just rerun a specific test by running it individually instead of rerunning our entire test suite. So I think that's an awesome feature built into VS Code. Okay, so now there's one last thing that I wanna show you in this video, and it's only gonna take a second. So I have some other preferred settings that I haven't shown in this video, and most of them are settings for uh, changing how the editor looks in their full screen Zen mode, and will allow me to run code without too much other stuff getting in the way. So I just wanna show these additional settings uh, so that you can see exactly how I'll have my code, uh, VS Code set up, if you see me using this in future videos. So I have those settings pulled up here in my browser, and these are also available on my GitHub page. So this is just the raw version of what's available on my GitHub. So I'm going to grab those. Now I'm gonna go back to VS Code and I'm going to open up my settings here. And I'm just going to replace all of my settings uh, with what I grabbed from my GitHub there. Now there's only a few additional changes here. So that made the font size a little smaller because these are my personal settings. Uh, let me change that back to be, let's see, what was that, 18, I think, for now. Um, so I will change that back to 18 while I'm recording the video. Um, actually, that's still a little bit too small, and that is because my zoom level is different for my personal preferences as well. So I'll change that back up to what was that, three, I think? Okay, yeah, so that is good for while we're recording this. So like I was saying, uh, these settings are mostly the same from what we just saw in this video, but there are a couple of changes in here to how the uh, Zen mode looks. So we can see here the Zen mode, I've got the center layout turned off, the full screen turned off, uh, hide line numbers turned off, stuff like that. And if you didn't know, their Zen mode is just their distraction-free mode that allows you to focus more on your code and hides lots of the uh, menus and things that you might find distracting. So let me open up one of my files here and let me actually open up Zen mode. So to do that, I'm just gonna open up my command palette here and type in Zen and I will toggle Zen mode. So I have these changed to where my Zen mode now looks like this. So we can see that we have a lot less distractions and it's basically just the code. So if I run this, I'm gonna run this using this over here. And now we can see that our output is nice and clean too. So if I do use VS Code in future tutorials, then this is likely how you're gonna see me using it. Uh, now the editor that I normally use for videos is Sublime Text, and I really like Sublime Text for its minimalist look so that we can just focus on the code and the output. But with Zen, Mo or with, uh, Zen Mode set up like this, we have a nice minimalist setup uh, in VS Code as well. So you might see me using this if I completely make the switch over to VS Code. Okay, so that's all I wanted to cover for the Python features that I wanted to show you in VS Code. Now there's a ton more to learn about Visual Studio Code itself, but I might save that for another video since this one is getting really long. Uh, so if anyone is interested, then the additional things that I'd like to cover in a future video would just be some of the editor features. So learning how to use the multi-cursor functionality, uh, some of my favorite keyboard shortcuts and things like that. But if you'd like to see some of these keyboard keyboard shortcuts for yourself, then they make it easy to learn these. We can open our command palette 
And if we just search for keyboard shortcuts, so let me search that, uh, then we can see here that one of the options is to open this keyboard shortcuts reference here. And this opens up a PDF online uh, that we can zoom into here. And we can see all the keyboard shortcuts available to us here. But like I said, I'd like to do a video in the near future uh, showing you some of my other favorite uh, VS Code uh, features like the multi-cursor functionality and also how to use some of those keyboard shortcuts that are listed on that reference page. Okay, so I think that is going to do it for this video. I hope you found this video helpful, especially if you're trying to switch over to VS Code for your Python development. So personally, I think they really knocked it out of the park with this editor. So as you saw, they have so many features that are built in, and the features that aren't built in are really easy to set up and get installed and also get configured. But if anyone has any questions about what we covered in this video, then feel free to ask in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer those. And if you enjoy these tutorials and would like to support them, then there are several ways you can do that. The easiest way is to simply like the video and give it a thumbs up. And also it's a huge help to share these videos with anyone who you think would find them useful. And if you have the means, you can contribute through Patreon and there's a link to that page in the description section below. Be sure to subscribe for future videos and thank you all for watching.